What is up, guys? Welcome back to another creator interview. We've got Brad Dwyer with us tonight, a uh, creator of, or a uh, writer and artist of Ape Man and the Apocalypse. Of the Apocalypse. Of the Apocalypse. Holy crap, sorry. <laughs> you didn't read Ape the title. Ape Man of the Apocalypse. I read it. <laughs> Brad, thank you so very much for joining us tonight. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I enjoyed reading this a lot, and I I wanted to start by asking, how did you come up, or how did you like come across the Ape Man of the Apocalypse? Because it's something that was already created, correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was the the initial story is based off of a, a story of Prize Comics from the 1940s with uh, Power Nelson. There's one one slim little uh, story about uh, Power Nelson going to this planet where apes are intelligent and they've enslaved the humans and stuff. And it just seemed like a good jumping off. Like I read it and it seemed like a good place to kind of like explore what happened after that story. Because it's it's very much like a, a golden age story where it just kind of ends abruptly like he, he forces the he forces the apes to liberate the humans and then that's just it and i maybe wonder like well what happens after that you can't just you can't just force somebody to get over their prejudice and then that's it absolutely dude can i how do, how do you come across those golden age stories because i feel like they're they're I, I think it was at a weird time where, like, uh, I was predominantly doing, like, autobio stuff, and I wanted, I felt like, because uh, you, you can kind of, I mean, there's a lot of really good artists in autobio stuff, but, like, what drew me to it initially was the fact that uh, there was so many, like, mini comics and stuff like that that were just kind of sc scrawled out and just, like, regardless of your... Uh, artistic ability and that's kind of where i started like i didn't have i didn't have a lot of artistic ability other than just like i drew as a kid and then i saw some mini comics and i was like i can do that so i kept doing that and eventually i got to the point where i was like well maybe i could draw like a, a genre kind of thing and i think my first uh idea was in my head because i had done a parody comic not that long before called a uh, genetically modified punk rock pandas awesome <laughs> um, it was literally just uh eight pages of uh panel by panel of the first turtles comic but it, i you know i thought it was funny because it was like a parody of a parody kind of thing and uh after i did that i was like well i'd kind of like to do other stuff like this so uh, i think my I, initial idea was like i was gonna do uh i was gonna do uh king kong versus jaws on the planet of the apes and that was my initial idea. And then like, I just started, I don't know. I, I started, I was already into public domain stuff anyways. And I was kind of curious, like, is there any uh, equivalent of Planet of the Apes or something to that effect that I could use in uh, my story? And then I came across that story and just kind of rolled from there. That's... How did you find out about the, uh that the characters were in public domain how does someone go about researching something like that is it um, something like google or a couple of websites that are like specifically uh about golden age characters and they'll tell you like like you can just, uh, search like specific things like uh, this guy is uh from the congo you know or whatever you know this is robot character they'll give you a list of those and then you can just kind of scroll through and see well, this is an interesting idea and then there's plenty of uh websites where you can go on there and just look up that specific story and see if see if it's anything because it's kind of cool like public domain stuff is like it's like the bare bones of something that never got to develop any further you know it's like superman started at that time you know and they slowly built and built and built upon Superman. Like there was no kryptonite, there was no Brainiac or any of that crap. It just so, slowly developed. So when you get like Golden Age stuff that's in the public domain, 
like I kind of feel like like you have the opportunity to take that and run with it. And it's certainly a brilliant idea, man, because the people that we've told about this book and that we've tried to get to read when we tell them, oh, yeah, what, what you're doing with public domain Golden Age characters, everyone's reaction is almost the same. They're like, oh, no shit. Yeah. Like, dang. And, and, and it and it dawns on them that you could actually do something like that. Well, there's been, a, I mean, there's been a lot of comics that have kind of taken that idea, but I think uh, whereas mine's a little bit different, it's like, it's it's kind of thrust into the 80s black and white kind of thing. Like, that's that's where I was coming at it from. It seems like uh, interesting. The, the, there's a lot of uh, parallels between the Golden Age stuff and the, uh, the 80s black and white stuff because it's basically everybody in the golden age was like figuring out how to make comics so there was all these weird like all the rules and stuff that we have now are not necessarily there like there's you know anatomy weird anatomy and there's arrows pointing to you which uh which panel you need to go to because it's not completely obvious and a lot of that stuff is kind of the same you see a lot of that same stuff happening again in the black and white explosion because there's all these uh, people that are amateurs just like thrust just going all in and not really like reading comics but not still not really totally understanding the rules because you don't really understand the narrative to really dive in and do it for a long time. Oh totally they're they're kind of coming at it from like an outsider's perspective right. Which, right. which is so cool though like it, it brings a whole new life and almost like yeah, yeah. This medium for sure yeah plus i think lately there's been a much uh, greater appreciation for black and white comics like i feel i see more and more people yeah, like the whole power comics thing i remember <laughs> when that was just uh before they had like the, the podcast and like they were publishing stuff or republishing older stuff like i remember it being just a weird thing on tumblr you know and I would just, I would go on there and look at like, oh, look, these comics are cool. And then at that point, like, there wasn't, a, there still wasn't a huge amount of interest. So I'd go on, like, mycomicshop.com and, like, search out all these crappy comics that they're, you know, they're like, oh, we're just going to sell these for a dollar. Now they sell for way more because I'm actually interested in it. So what got you started? What what was it like? Um, how long, how long has this been going on? Because I don't think I really saw it. Um... Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of weird because... It's not, I probably started somewhere around like 2015, like actually like doing sketches and then uh, kind of drawing the first issue. Because the first few issues are like, they're 44 pages, you know, it, they're pretty intensive, especially when I'm doing all the crap myself. And then, because um, I kind of thought, I was like, oh, I'll try this. I'll do like, I'll do like three books. I'll do like three or four. 44 pages you know and that'll be my thing i'll go on to the next thing but uh i just kind of kept going with it because it's it's kind of uh it's like marvel method but by yourself like you know points you want to hit but there's nobody stopping you from like taking weird diversions all over the place you know so so that's how i kind of approached it I, the first uh, kirby stuff that i really got into was um uh, is Jimmy Olsen run? Like I, I found a copy of it at uh, a library. I was in my early twenties, and I had seen Kirby stuff before, but it never connected with, connected with me. But uh, the all the weird concepts and just like ideas shooting back and forth uh, in that book, like really like changed changed something in my head. I was just gonna say that's so cool. I. I don't know that i've talked to anyone who who says like jimmy olsen is the kirby that that <laughs> well, it's the first that like i came across that i i, I picked it up because i had seen like <clears throat> captain america stuff and i was just like all right whatever but that was the first thing where i was like i don't know what was happening i was like why are these tree people why is jimmy olsen so pissed off you know <laughs> there's people from other dimensions and shit like i don't know this is crazy so that and that kind of that kind of led me to, to like a lot of the other Kirby stuff, like the other Fourth World stuff and the 
and his Bronze Age stuff. It's pretty uh, wild, all the double dinosaur and all that stuff. And even into the later period, you know, we get like Captain Victory and uh, Silver Star. Like Captain Victory is probably my favorite uh, Kirby book in general. Yeah, I think that's the definition of range right there. Right. <laughs> that's. And you're right. I think that uh, when you go back as a uh, comic fan, you look at Kirby stuff, you start seeing that this portion of, like uh, bodies, the way he drew like his monsters. I was just having a conversation with someone about Kirby monsters. I'm like, so we should do a spotlight on that just alone because oh yeah, it's it's intense. It's the way he drew them. And and again, that's why I think we appreciate books like yeah. yours, where it's it, you know, I think there's a huge emphasis right now with a lot of people wanting certain comic characters to look almost perfect, like certain, and, and sometimes that's not it. That's not the play for us. That We're not looking for that, you know? We're looking for something... Gritty. Yeah, and so your stuff delivers that. So that's why as soon as we saw this book, we we're like, dude, we gotta, we gotta talk to this guy. We gotta read these books. We gotta get more and more people to read them because I think that this is... These books are legit, man. Um... And it looks like so. So I'm I'm shocked you were saying it's taken from 2015. It's like that's I wouldn't have. That's like yeah, almost a, almost a decade ago. Well, I mean, like I always approached it like I would work on I would work on Ape M, but I, I would also do like a couple anthology stories throughout the year. And like I was always I never wanted to like just do one thing. So even now, like I'm. I'm, uh, I haven't started on the next eight man. I'm working on uh, a, a, the third issue of this zine I'm doing called Municipal Threat. So, sorry, what was it called? Municipal. It's called Municipal Threat. It's like this. It's a zine about uh, about exploitation movies, B movies, and stuff. It's, it's kind of split, but yeah, it's yeah. kind of split between. Uh, <laughs> you got those two. <laughs> between reviews and then people. Uh, artists like me telling them hey can you do do your what e movie you would want to see in five or six pages you know and then i always and i always do a huge story in there yeah and you're doing the frankenstein one too yeah, right i was gonna ask yeah that's fun uh, that's you gonna work on uh third issue yeah i'm i'm big on uh universal hammer monster and stuff like that i mean yeah. Well, I mean, all all kinds of B movies, but I'm, I have a soft spot for that stuff. So, are we going to see the uh, the entire uh, <laughs> Universal Monsters line, or? I mean, you... well, I mean, t- technically, I mean, I already did. Uh, I already did Dracula and uh, and uh, the Wolfman, and in the first issue. Then the second one, uh, not so much. The second one's got Jesus. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, atonement. I'm flipped through. I'm on board. I love it. I'll tell you where that one came from because this is basically like a Jesus revenge, like <laughs> in a movie that came from uh, me rereading some of those Lifehill prophets. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in those, but I never, I mean, I, I wasn't, I, I read comics in the 90s, but I wasn't super into life, though. But uh, I went back and I was reading some of them, and I thought it was hilarious that, like, you know, especially, like, the ones that are drawn by Platt. It has this huge dude that's, like, ripped, and he's, like, you know, cutting people's heads off and shit, and he's quoting Bible verses while he's doing it. So I just, like, <laughs> here it is juxtaposition, so I just wanted to replicate that to some degree <laughs> it, was, it was the bible in your face it was right like, it was the yeah. 90s attitude man <laughs> it was the attitude era <laughs> we're gonna get preachy in your face though <laughs> man so so what was what uh what kind of comics were you reading then as you were growing up uh, other than jimmy olsen and uh <laughs> well that was, that was i didn't do that until my tw- like 20s i think yeah. I, yeah. My brother had some comics when I was a kid. Like he had some Bronze Age stuff. Like I, I remember, I remember really distinctly um, him having a couple of issue, issues of uh, Craven's Last Hunt, where like it's like naked in a, a huge thing of spiders, and he's just like eating them. I remember that really vividly. And then uh, I kind of read comics into the '90s, you know, like through when that stuff was coming out. Um, 
like all the image stuff, but then at the same time I was like reading Ninja Turtles. Uh, and then I just kind of fell off of it until uh, my twenties. Like I was, I just like played the games and stuff until until my twenties. And then I kind of uh, there was a comic shop next to a Denny's, and I was hung over one day getting breakfast, and I went into the comic shop and found uh, mini comics and stuff, and then just kind of uh, snowballed from there. When you sit down to do something like eight men of the apocalypse or any of the other books that you do do you go off of a script or do you kind of just start laying paint uh, panels out and then you kind of think of what you're going to say afterward or how, what's your what's your creative process look like uh typically i just have an idea of where i need to go or maybe a couple scenes that i want to get to and then i just get it get into it <laughs> and sometimes i have to edit as i go like i'll sometimes you know maybe i'll be like i'll come back later and be like i don't know if this uh maybe this might be this scene might need another transition and i'll add a page or something like that but typically uh i try to do it just kind of like Kirby method because he just kind of started an issue and then just went through so that's kind of how I try to do it. I have an idea of where I need to go in this issue, but I'm gonna, if, if there's tangents, I'm gonna follow those tangents. Nice. It, it feels super energetic. Like, I think, you... I think that method of doing it, I mean, I think there's more coherent ways of doing it. There's a lot more coherent ways of doing it, but I, I, I always kind of liked uh, uh, to a, at least a small degree being like, reading something and be like, ah, what? How did we get here? You know? Yeah. I kind of like, like, a little bit of confusion in there. It's just exciting. You're like, I don't know, let's swallow it. You know? so <laughs> oh, he stepped through a wormhole. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he stepped in. <laughs> yeah, reading this, you can tell you, you've got a, some TMNT influence in there heavily. I... <clears throat> Yeah, I had the, I had the, in the 90s, I had the uh, first reprints, the ones, uh, the color ones, I had the, the, the color four color. trade paperbacks of those, and then I kind of caught the very end of the first black and white run, the City of War, right. the original City of War, <clears throat> and then uh, kind of like, even when I wasn't reading comics, I still kind of followed those. Because I still, because I have uh, copies of like volume four, the ones that uh, Peter Laird and uh, Jim Lawson were putting out like before the sale to uh, Nickelodeon and stuff. So I always, I always kind of kept up with that stuff because I really like. Is there anything that you're reading currently? Like what? What is it? Are do you have enough time to read comics? And, and I, mean, I do. I, I have. I I tend to. Um, I have like a million bookmarks and a million books all the time. So like, uh, I read, I still read a lot of uh, Bronze Age stuff, like reading uh, the, uh, the the Marvel Frankenstein book right now. And then um, I also have that uh, Vendetta, Holy Vindicator, right? I have that book. I don't know. I, I, I kind of go between uh, Bronze Age stuff and the, like whatever your independent stuff is coming out. So is there an active pull list right now or you just kind of pick up as you go along and you see something on the rack? Uh, I've always been like that. I, I, I just pick stuff up. I'm not very good at following stuff. <laughs> <laughs> get, him, get him with the first issue, folks. <laughs> As an independent creator, what is like some advice you can give to somebody who wants to start out as an independent creator? Like, um, think really hard about it. <laughs> um, um, advice. That's a weird thing. I mean, I would think, um, if, like, if you want to do it, just do it. Um, you're going to suck at it. You're going to suck at it for a long, long time. People are going to be like, it's not very good and you're gonna keep doing it I and mean, you have to just be you have to like be cognizant of two different things one that you suck and two that you're like no it's, it's pretty good you have to have both of those things in your head <laughs> <laughs> point 
for years, you know? Because <laughs> I think uh, my first mini comic was like in, uh, I want to say 2003. That was when I, that was the first time, first thing I published. It, it's god awful. It's like the, you know? But but to you at the time, you were like, this is pretty good. Yeah, exactly. I was, and, and, you know, at, but at the same time, I kind of knew it sucks. <laughs> I just kept going. And, you know, eventually you do like at least kind of find your place, you know, where you're like, uh, where you make uh, make mistakes, but you make them authoritative. <laughs> like like you know i'm like drawing a hand i'm like this hand looks like shit but it looks like i drew this hand you know <laughs> that's my look <laughs> so if you're gonna mess up mess up <laughs> that's awesome so you mean do you get compliments on this a lot do you get compliments a lot of your current work now do people come up and you like, oh, this is I, did, I do i I'm, I'm a little bit surprised sometimes when i mean i haven't done a lot of uh i've only done a few shows since the whole like pandemic thing but uh, but even online like online and in uh the few shows i've done i've been i've been uh, surprised at the response but also, I, I kind of feel like <clears throat> part of that's uh, me getting better, and, and part of that's just like me sticking around because I never really stopped. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think both of those things uh, are validated. Yeah, there's a lot of value in stick to I think a lot of people, they end up, yeah, they end up respecting you because they realize, dude, this guy's really not going to stop. So right, right. you need to keep talking smack or buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> and mostly they'll choose the latter. They'll just buy the book. <laughs> well, I, I saw you guys walking around with the camera in Arizona. And when they panned across your booth, I was like, that one. I need those. Yeah. The, and, yeah. Like, and it was before we told them we had already picked 100%, them up. hundred percent, man. Was like, we were it's, showing them the clip. It's so sick. Like, it just looks so good. It's, it's eye-grabbing. Like, if you're talking, like, pick something off the rack, that's that's what I'm going to every time. It, it, it looks good. Right color. Well, appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, if somebody wanted to get into the municipal threat, what do they do to, to hook up with you? So right now, uh, Municipal Threat is being sold through uh, Fluke Fanzine. So Fluke Fanzine is on Instagram too, and like that's a local guy that puts out, zine, puts out his own zine. He's okay. putting it close. So you can find him on Instagram. Okay, it's right there. We'll find it. Cool. And then where can people find you? Basically, you just find me on Instagram. I, I I don't even know if like I just I don't know if like websites even matter anymore. So I never even bothered to get one. I'm just like I'm on Instagram. I'm Brad Dwyer. Brad Dwyer comments. It's not hard to find me. Yeah, cool. And we'll tag you and everything. So yeah. <laughs> they really put you on TikTok, Instagram. <laughs> no, you know, I'm like, in that stage where I feel comfortable with TikTok, but I'm okay with. Instagram. We're gonna make you in a little. We're gonna yeah. put your head on somebody dancing. AI is crazy. <laughs> crazy now, man. You don't really have to do much. Just give us permission, and we'll be all right. <laughs> put a date body. There you go. <laughs> man. Yeah, I really just. I know. I it's, all the social media stuff is hard, right? Most most of the time, I just want to draw, and keep to myself. But I know I have to like maintain a little bit of that stuff. Yeah, especially if you want to uh, sell issues. It's <laughs> right. no, true. And I have sold a good chunk of, I mean, especially over the course of the pandemic. You know, I was, that was pretty much the only way I was getting stuff to people was just sending it to them. Is this like a second or, or is this your primary, like? Uh, uh, I have a fledgling uh, screen printing business that I'm working on right now. Okay. And then, uh, so no, I definitely, I definitely can't. I definitely can't uh, make ends meet with just, uh, just this. But, but at the same time, like I was watching, I was watching something about this uh, serial killer 
and they described it. They described him as because uh, he had like a job and stuff. And they were like, but this was his career, and I was like, that was the only time I've probably been like, I feel I'm like that serial killer. This is like, <laughs> I'm not paid like, for it, but it's my career. <laughs> <laughs> I identify with this. <laughs> oh my god. Don't, yeah, don't isolate that one. <laughs> the man of the apocalypse. Oh, man. Serial killer maker. <laughs> Tag at FBI. I was like, <laughs> FBI, just in case. <laughs> oh man, you got any other shows you're, you're doing anytime soon? Like any uh, uh, comic events? Um. Nothing coming up right now. I might have something out of state in uh, August, but I'm not still working out the details for it. Okay. But other than that, uh, other than that, I just want to bear down and get some more stuff done. Sounds awesome, man. Awesome. No, I was gonna say, man, thank you so much, man, for joining yeah, us. Thank you um, for your time. I appreciate you guys taking the time to read through my weird, insane, uh, incoherent. Oh, this is up our alley. Yeah, we love this. Yeah, we love this. Yeah. This we love this stuff, I think it says more about us than it does about yeah. yours. <laughs> <laughs> we keep telling, to, we're like I said, man. We're trying to get more and more people to uh, to read it, and uh, I think that's our goal ultimately for what we do is to get more comics into people's hands, and we just love, exp- you know showing that there's more than just one genre there's there's so many different types of creators out there and um it's it's an incredible it's a vast there's so much to it that you know you're, you're not just stuck with that. <laughs> yeah but thank you so much brad for everything thank you for your work thank you for uh, joining us tonight man and uh uh keep on doing what you're doing and uh, let us know we'll we'll continue to pick up anything that you do man all right thank you so much man Thank nice you. talking. Nice. Have a good night. Night.